Experiences are what people love the most about travel. Viator is a website and app where you can book travel experiences like hiking Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania or enjoying the views while cruising on a catamaran in the Caribbean. They offer everything from simple tours to extreme adventures. With over 300,000 bookable experiences in 190 countries, there's something for everyone. Plus, Viator's travel experiences have millions of real traveler reviews, so you have the information you need to book the best activities for your trip. When you book a travel experience with Viator, there's always flexibility and support with free cancellation, payment options, and 24-7 service. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10, that's V-I-A-T-O-R-10, for 10% off your first booking in the app. One app, over 300,000 travel experiences you'll remember. Do more with Viator. Hi there, thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. Great to have your company yet again for this episode 358, or is it 35.8? Can't tell by my writing. Coming up, we're going to be looking again at Planet Nine. There's some new information that's come forward that might actually point to the possibility of it really existing. We'll uh, investigate that. And I don't think too many people in the world have not heard about the Titan submersible disaster. Well, there are lessons in that for the space tourism industry, which we'll also be discussing. Uh, and we will answer some audience questions. We've got a, a question that came in anonymously about emission spectra, but it's a really interesting question. Uh, Roger wants to explore comets, and Johnny uh, says the Big Bang and the size of the universe don't add up. Please explain. We'll do all that today on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me as he does occasionally is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Uh, it's always a happy occasion when I turn up on Space Nuts. Thank yes. you, Andrew. Yeah, I think it makes me happy. Otherwise, I'd be sitting here going, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? Yeah. Um, how are things? Uh, okay. You got, you got a new toy. I did. I do. Uh, in fact, uh, two new toys. Uh, <laughs> one I'm staring at at the moment uh, is the new computer, which uh, is uh, up and running, at least as far as Space Nuts is concerned. There's still a lot of hard work to do to lick it into shape, but it yes. is. Um, it's fabulous. Um, and um, like most scientists, uh, I'm a Mac user, and so without advertising anything, um, I'm delighted to say it's a new Mac. <laughs> oh, very good. All right. And uh, did I see a little note about you having a new member of the family? There is, yes, another toy. Uh, uh, let me, we've got oh. a minute to go and... Yeah, sure, why not? I mean, oh, I mean, he's got to leave the building. Okay. This is intriguing to me. Um, so I don't know exactly what he's got, but uh, I know there's there's been a recent addition with the cat, although that might be a year or two down the, the track now, but, uh, oh, Hello. What have we got here? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's a puppy. It's a puppy. Is that a um a little poodle? It's a toy poodle, yeah. Toy right. poodle. Who is nine weeks old. Aww. And um, I'm absolutely not a dog person, Andrew. I never wanted a dog, never thought I'd have a dog. But this little guy won my heart. Oh. Now, um. To- Hugh has suggested you need to come up with a very Space Nuts-related name. Well, he's already got a name, um, oh. which is more connected with my ancestry. So he's Cole Black, uh, and he's named after the Geordie Miners of northeastern England who are okay. <laughs> So his name's Geordie. Geordie. Oh, I like it. Yes. Yes. On, his, on his medal. He looks a bit bashful at the moment. He's, he's at the moment. I think he's just he's just fallen asleep. Actually. Oh, I get it. Well, like, now you're stuck with him for the next forty minutes. <laughs> well, you know, he's going to go back very quickly. <laughs> well, he, get, he did sit on my knee for an entire hour long uh, Teams meeting yesterday with colleagues in the department. Right. Um, Until he peed. But then, uh, oh yeah, he does all that. Uh, he, he, as you know, we've had a bereavement in our family, and yeah. so. Um, 
this little fellow, we've got a breed of dogs in Australia called Blue Healers. We do. This one is a black healer, and healer is spelt differently in the course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it'll help. Yeah. It'll help. Mm. Very, very. I'm going to take him back because he's. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll sit here and do what I do best, which is nothing. And how cute. Um, so we've got Muscat somewhere prowling around. I wonder how Muscat is taking to the new arrival. I can imagine there might not be um, much love lost between the two of them for a little while, but uh, time will tell, I imagine. Yeah. Dogs and cats living together. What's the world coming to? Uh, I was just uh, wondering how Muscat has um, <laughs> well reacted. Sorry there too, Andrew. Muscat um, sp- has spent the last... Uh, a bit longer than a weekend uh, in hospital. Oh, no. he's very well. Uh, so this all happened while he was away in hospital. So he oh. came back yesterday, and uh, he he noticed that there was something different in the household <laughs> quite quickly. Mm. Uh, but he's look. They're going to be. I, I think they're going to be the best of friends. I'm sure. Oh, eventually, he will eventually. There'll be a view. Cat scratches on the dog's muzzle before that happens. I yeah, think. maybe. I don't know. The the dog's pretty quick. Uh, Muscat is not. He'll need to be. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, well, good for you. Uh, now, let's get into this uh, interesting yeah, story. Good, yeah, I, I think, yeah, we, we're here for some reason. Uh, hmm. uh, let's, we could start a dog podcast. <laughs> would that be a dog cast? Uh, yeah, it would be. Uh, oh, let's... boom, boom. Boom, fish for Fred. Um, let's get into this interesting story about Planet Nine and uh, possibly some indications that it exists because of something else that has landed on Earth, apparently. Yeah, that's that's quite right. That's um, that really, you know, one, it's one of these things that I love where you've got two quite different uh, avenues of research and suddenly they come together mm. in a completely unexpected fashion. So... Recapping on Planet Nine, uh, I think it was back in 2016. You know, we've been talking about this really since the beginning of the podcast. Yeah, that um, it was noted that some of the uh, what are called extreme TNOs, extreme trans-Neptunian objects, things that are way, way beyond the orbit of Neptune, maybe ten times as far away as Pluto. Yeah, uh, at their at their extremities, because these all move in very elongated orbits. Um, many of those TNOs, extreme TNOs, uh, have their orbits kind of aligned uh, all on one side of the solar system. So if you think of a map of the solar system, we've got the planets going around in circles in the middle, and, and on this scale they're invisible because it's, we're talking about very big scales. Mm-hmm. And then you've got all these elliptical orbits of the transneptunian objects, the uh, extreme ones. Uh, and the sort of axes of these ellipses, the, the elongated uh Length, well, long length of the orbit. They all they don't align exactly, but they're all clustered within an angle of probably ninety degrees or something. Some of them more closely aligned than others. Some, um, you know, there's a group of them that are probably aligned with an angle of five, ten degrees, something like that. And so it was that observation um, in 2016 or thereabouts that led uh, astronomers. Is it Berkeley? I can't remember where these guys are. It's terrible. Uh, but um, the, uh, the the uh, the the group of astronomers looked at this very carefully and deduced that it may be due to the perturbing influence of a planet at a much greater distance from the sun uh, of, than any of the regular planets that we know about. Yeah, uh, estimated to be four to ten times the mass of the Earth. Mm. Uh, so fitting actually rather neatly into a category of planets which we call super earths which we found which we find a lot of in other solar systems in in you know in the in the extra the ex, sorry ex, exoplanet world the extra solar yeah. planet world uh, so that's the hypothesis that leads to the idea that there is a, a ninth planet in the solar system um, and the problem now is finding it because it's a long long way away as i said like these uh, t- transneptunian or Objects probably up to ten times as far away from the sun as Pluto. Uh, so finding something out there because people are probably saying, "Look, if it's so big, why 
you know, we should have found yeah. it by now, but it, it's such a long way away. There's there's very little light. That's and I, I think I read somewhere that it would be like using a microscope to find something you dropped in the sand. Or that's, similar. That's probably about right, because um, the place where it's sort of, pre- you can make a prediction of whereabouts in its orbit is likely to be from yeah. how these uh, other orbits are made. And the prediction suggests that it's kind of in the middle of the Milky Way. Mm. And so what you're trying to observe is an object in the Milky Way that looks like one of the stars in the Milky Way, but is moving incredibly slowly because uh, as objects get to their, uh, what's called their aphelion, the furthest point away from the sun, they move much more slowly than when they're at perihelion, the nearest point to the sun. That's one of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's you know kind of moving along so slowly that its motion will be barely noticeable. My guess is um, we we should put this on the record uh, that the uh, the Vera C Rubin telescope, when it starts its work, uh, used to be called the LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, uh, will be doing surveys of the of the sky. Uh, it will be able to survey the entire sky uh, to an unprecedented an unprecedented depth. Uh, every three days, I think it is. It's incredible that it can do that. The entire southern sky, it's in the southern hemisphere. Right. And maybe, just maybe, um, because it will be looking for objects that are moving, maybe the Vera C. Rubin telescope, when it kicks off, I think it's starting late next year, observations, maybe that will turn it up. Uh, mm-hmm. me, and well, the, ja- the James Webb wouldn't be capable? Um, it's not the right telescope for doing that um, because right. it's got a much more a much narrower field of view. What you need to find this is a survey telescope, like our Schmidt telescope was at Siding Spring in the yeah. photography days, where you're, you're actually imaging a very large uh, chunk of sky. It was six degrees on a side at the Schmidt telescope. And I think the uh, the LSS, sorry, the um, Vera C. Rubin telescope, I, I, I think, I can't remember, it's two or three degrees, I think, it's field of view, but that's what you need. The James Webb is focusing in on a really tiny area of the sky. Uh, so it's looking in detail at, you know, particular objects. And uh, now, um, now the, the, uh, yes, the meanwhile is... But yes, this, this oh, is the interesting part. So C Neos 14, and C Neos is something near Earth Asteroid Survey. I can't remember what the C stands for. Um, this, uh, this is an object which is actually a meteorite which fell into the Pacific uh, back in 2014. And so uh, two researchers at Harvard University have uh, published uh, quite recently a paper saying uh, that this object, its its trajectory when it entered the atmosphere, uh, because it was observed, um, did not come from the solar system. Uh-huh. So. The saying is an extra solar asteroid. An extra solar asteroid, that's right, uh, or a, an extra solar meteorite. It's probably. Yeah. I, I don't know whether there's an estimate for how big this thing was. Um, it is actually the the estimate is a, of the order of a meter. It's mm. small, but its trajectory as it came into the Earth's atmosphere tells you uh, that it hit the Earth at a very high speed. Sixty kilometers per second is what they're suggesting, and that's typical. Geez, that'd, that'd put a dent in your Lamborghini. It would, it would if it hadn't burned up and fallen into the Pacific. If your <laughs> Lamborghini's in the m- middle of the Pacific, you're probably in trouble anyway. Yeah, for uh, sure. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so this thing uh, came from interstellar space. Hmm. Uh, but what they, what they looked at then was, okay, the, the alternative p- possibility that it's come from interstellar space is that it's flown by something in the solar system and had a gravity assist uh, oh. like we do with spacecraft. So it's yes. got past something uh, and its velocity has been bumped up to the 60 kilometers per second. Uh, and they, so they did that. They looked at that because they could reconstruct its, its trajectory through the inner solar system. Mm. And they discovered that it didn't pass any of the known planets. So, right. so uh, it rather, didn't get an assist from Jupiter or Saturn or right. any that's of those. That's right. But wait a minute. Here we go. Here's <laughs> the smoking gun. Yeah, the smoking gun. What if it flew past Planet Nine? 
Yeah. And so what they did was they they looked at the sort of trajectory of this uh, Cineas 14, the object that was fell into the Pacific, and mapped it on the sky. And basically, uh, it was exactly where we think Planet Nine might be. Uh, not that we know where it is, but where you know all the evidence suggested it that it is. And the uh, authors of this new paper suggest that that uh, is uh, very likely. The probability that such a coincidence is the result of chance, as physics.org says, is of the order of 1%. Mm-hmm. So saying there's a, quite a high degree of certainty uh, with uh, the messenger, sorry, the, um, the, uh, the object itself, uh, that, that, it, that, it, that rather than being an interstellar messenger, it's maybe something that's been in our solar system and has been whacked up to this very high velocity by an interaction with Planet Nine and came in at this angle and landed in the Pacific Ocean. Um, uh, so it sounds really compelling, but it's not absolute proof, proof positive. But no, gee, no. Um, it would take some arguing against by the sound of it. Yeah, it's look, it's like like many other things that you find in space. It's a, it's a very um, uncanny coincidence you know, there's coincidences everywhere in the universe, the biggest one being the fact that the moon's 400 times smaller than the sun and 400 times nearer, uh, which is why we have eclipses, um, which is definitely uncanny. So you can't write off a potential coincidence. You can't, that's right. You can't write it off. Um, uh, in fact, this um, I've been reading, uh, as I mentioned, this is on physic.org, but it actually is a piece that was on the conversation uh, by the authors actually of this um uh, of this work, so it's worth uh, checking it out. Have a look for uh, this. There could still be a ninth planet in our solar system. On the conversation, yeah. Do, now, what would happen next? Do they? Uh, do, do, will people try to follow this up, or uh, maybe the Vera Rubin Telescope will uh, sort of take this theory and and see if they can glean anything from it? Yes, there is. Um, so what? So if you make the assumption um, that this object was deflected by Planet Nine, and they suggest that would have been 30 to 60 years ago. Yeah. Um, then what you can do is, uh, knowing the trajectory of the object, uh, since you know we think it's come past Planet Nine, that basically narrows down your, uh, your um, estimate of where Planet Nine is in the sky now. It's, it's sort of, you know, rather than being a, a huge chunk of sky... Um, in it's actually it's kind of not far from the equator. Where it's, it's where uh, Aries, Taurus, and Cetus meet. That's mm. really saying uh, this this object would be. So um, they're, they're, what they're doing now is carrying out a search in exactly that region where where they they focus down uh, from the Cineos fourteen observations that that that's where this thing might be found. So if they find a moving object in there. Uh, it uh, it is, you know, it's going to be a classic case of uh, detective work of the highest order. And uh, like I might quote um, uh, a, a quick quote on uh, on what they say in their conversation piece. We have an observation campaign underway uh, to carry out this search. The task is still difficult, and it will take time and work because the field to be scanned is still large, and the object sort is very dim. But it does now seem doable. And uh, I want to say, of course, our, today our ha- hypothesis is no more than speculation, just like the existence of Planet Nine itself. However, it is a well-founded speculation that meets the three requirements to be taken seriously in science. A, it's physically plausible. B, it's well explained. And C, it's empirically variable. Uh, and that would be the case if they actually found it. Yes. Uh, Planet Nine uh, indicated by the position of Cineas 14, uh, where it came from. Uh, which stands for Centre for Near Earth Object Studies, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and, and being as big as they think Planet Nine might be, like, you know, 10 times bigger than Earth, was it, or something to that effect, um, yeah, or it, it, would, it, it would have a significant gravitational effect, I yeah, imagine. Absolutely, that's yeah. right. Gosh, we're nearly there. Let's, yeah, I, I want to believe it. I really do. I hope. I hope they've found it, and um, we'll know soon enough. I suppose oh, this is almost. Or not? We'll know one day. Yes. Yes, we will. 
This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Okay, Fred, uh, let's move on to a rather somber topic, and that is um, a, a reflection on uh, last week's terrible disaster involving the Titan submersible, which uh, imploded while uh, taking people, five people down to look at the Titanic. And uh, it's been a terrible tragedy, but uh, there are lessons to learn from it uh, in regard to space tourism. And I I must say, in um, reviewing uh, some of the thoughts about the Titan disaster and and the relationship to sending people into space, uh, going underwater is not dissimilar to flying a spacecraft because you've got to manoeuvre in um, three dimensions, uh, up, down, left, right, backwards, forwards, whereas on the road, driving a car, w- one of those elements comes out because you're not flying or floating. Um, so it's it's the, the similarities are, are quite significant. Uh, so are the dangers, as it turns out, and this is the lesson that needs to be learned, I think. Um, and indeed, that's right. Um, the the other similarity is, of course, that you're in a, a tin capsule, if I yeah. put it that way, which has got extraordinary pressures on its walls, and in fact, far more uh, for the submersible uh, mm. than you would have on a spacecraft. The yeah, spacecraft, I think it's it, at its depth, it had like 400 g on it or something. It's it's 480 uh, atmospheres. Atmospheres, you yeah. know, 500 atmospheres. So. It's, that's the atmospheric pressure multiplied by 480. I think it's yeah. uh, Whereas on a, and that, and that's all pressing inwards, whereas in a spacecraft you've got one atmosphere pressing outwards. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're, but but the the risk is the same in both. You're you're talking about any kind of breach in that capsule that you're in in the enclosure, the envelope of what of the area that you're in. Any kind of breach is is catastrophic. Mm. Uh, and more so in the case of the the, the submersible, and I um, may never know what triggered the implosion, but it was obviously it, it had to be a breach, a, a, a break in a seal, or or just a well, a pinhole or something. Some of the analysis I read, um, because this submersible had made several trips, yeah, and was that the there's an, it had an unusual uh, composition for the capsule, which involved. Yeah fibers and I think uh, the comment by one of the engineers that I read said that 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 every time it went down those carbon fibers would be stressed uh, and yes they'll they'll do the job for a while but eventually they'll give way and that's yeah. the suggestion that's that that's the figure gosh yeah um, really horrific yeah so what's the lesson for space tourism because this this is a really um well, let's let's like, I'll put it in a way that people might understand because this is how it's coming through in my mind. But space tourism, to a certain degree, is like the wild wild west at the moment. Well, it is and it isn't. Uh, yeah. uh, it's I mean, space generally. Some people think it's like the wild west with the advent of satellite constellations, mm. but there are regulations. But um, I, I, what we're perhaps focusing on here, Andrew, is some comments by. A uh, very senior engineer, who is uh, is Italian by birth, Tommaso Scorba. Uh, he is the executive director of something called the International Association for the Advancement of Space Safety, which mm. tells it like it is. But it, but he's also got a very um, a strong track record from uh, the European Space Agency. He was a former head of space flight safety. Uh, at the European Space Agency, and so he was focused entirely on this issue. And what he's saying uh, in a a fairly lengthy piece that, um, again, was reported uh, on space.com, it's actually by uh, Teresa Pultarova. Uh, That's the name of the person who's written this piece, but it quotes uh, uh, Dr. Skoba, Tommaso Skoba, the engineer, uh, very, um, uh, very widely. Uh, and his point is exactly what you just said, the, the parallel between this infant industry of space tourism and the infant 
industry of, uh, of, of submersible tourism, the Titanic exploration, that, that there are strong parallels. And um, the bottom line is you must not dodge the regulation or the regulatory framework. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, maybe I can just uh, read a couple of the, the, the quotes that are, that are in this particular article. There's a bit of noise going on outside, for which I apologize a little. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, and this is um, a, an organization called the Commercial Spaceflight Federation, mm. and that represents the space tourism companies, uh, has not actually apparently commented uh, yet on the possible in- implications of the Ocean Gate saga, the, 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 you know, the fact that uh, this horrible accident happened. Um, but there is uh, an, an interview that's been recorded and the Federation's president apparently argued very strongly against having a regulatory framework that would, uh, you know, that would give the tick of approval uh, to the engineering of some of these spacecraft. Uh, and the argument was summarized uh, by uh, th- this paragraph, which uh, I'll quote, the vehicles that have been designed today are quite different from each other. And so if regulations had been written on any one style, that would really have prevented some of these designs from coming to the market. And that is absolutely true. When you look at... Um, Blue Origin, with its sort of standard, you know, uh, firework rocket yes. uh, launch vehicle with a capsule on top, goes up, a capsule detaches, goes up, goes up to uh, 100 kilometers. You've got this weightlessness, come down on a parachute while the, uh, the rocket uh, launcher itself lands. That's quite different from Virgin Galactic's scenario where you've got a space plane that is carried underneath the belly of a, a turbo jet aircraft. Uh, to about 16 kilometers and then launched as a rocket to take you up to the uh, altitude at which you can see the Earth's curvature and the blackness of space and all of that. So th- that's that's true that these things are very different. But um, I think this is not uh, this is not necessarily a good reason for re- um, declaring yourself exempt from the requirement for certification. That's the bottom. Mm. And perhaps I can quote uh, this engineer, Tommaso Sgoba. Uh, he says, this, the certification is essentially a peer review of your design by an expert. Instead of waiting for an accident, you perform your hazard analysis in advance. The solution to your hazard analysis is entirely in your design, and you get input from other people who understand this matter and that can help you make your product as safe as possible. Yeah. And so... Um, I guess he's he's aiming those comments at well, perhaps Virgin Galactic, perhaps Blue Origin, but interestingly, not at SpaceX. Hmm. And that's because SpaceX has had uh, um, the benefit of contracting to NASA, so it's had to uh, fulfil all the regulations that the you know the National Space Agency uh, has in place. Uh, so SpaceX has. Um, essentially it had to meet these requirements for its uh, formal um, contracts with NASA. You know, there's taxiing astronauts up and down to the International Space Station with the crew, crew Dragon capsules. It's had to do all that. And so now when it turns Crew Dragon into a tourist vehicle, and we've seen evidence of that recently, uh, then you have all the regulations in place. Uh, and, but I might just... Um, add a postscript of my own to this, if I may, Andrew. Sure. That is that, uh, because I don't want to be seen as being critical of any of these organizations, they are all uh, working in good faith uh, and doing their very best to make things as safe as possible. Uh, I mean, uh, Scoba's point is that they should fall within a regulatory framework. But uh, all all that I've heard, uh, particularly from the few astronauts that I, I know well enough to talk to about this. Um, they've all said, uh, Virgin Galactic in particular, I don't have any comments on Blue Origin, and if the case, the situation might be identical with Blue Origin. But Virgin Galactic in particular has been very careful uh, to follow the regulations, even though 
it is still sitting outside the certification process. Mm. It's fascinating. And I suppose um, one of the things that I've uh, read in regard to this is that uh, back in 2004, US Congress issued a moratorium on regulations, uh, which have been continuously extended. And I think they expire in October this year. And they may then decide because of the Titan disaster that the, the rules need to be tightened up. But as far as um, companies having to prove flight worthiness, all they have to prove is that they don't prove uh, uh, pose a risk to any of those um, uh, people on Earth or airspace and demonstrate that their space vehicles worked during one previous flight. I mean, that, that's a pretty thin it is, isn't it? veil of safety yeah. if, you, if you really look into it. Um, and, and, and that, I guess, is one of the telling factors in this, that the FAA, FAA doesn't have much of a jurisdiction in terms of uh, space tourism safety. Um, and, and that's probably where things need to tighten up. Yes, uh, uh, th- uh, that's, that's right. I mean, I, mean um, one, I guess one indicator of how seriously uh, Virgin Galactic in particular takes this is that they have had an accident that was back in 2014 yeah that's right one of their test pilots and the other other one was injured and that was actually human error that was shown to be um uh so that was 2014 uh when will be the first commercial fair paying flight with virgin galactic well it turns out just by coincidence andrew that it's tomorrow as we're recording this 29th of june is the date that's been set uh, for the first flight, it's actually uh, Italian. I think it's Italian Air Force members, and it, I think it's a flight that will have scientific purpose as well. But it's, uh, as I understand it, it is a paid flight, so it's the start of Virgin Galactic's um, tourist operations, mm. fair-paying passengers. So yeah, it's. Uh, it, it, I think your point's well made that it's really interesting to see what will happen to the legislation and regulation in the wake of the the Titan. Indeed, it will. All right. Uh, if you want to chase that story up, it's on space.com. Uh, really fascinating read, too, I, I, I might add. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Zero G, and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Space Nuts. Space Nuts. Okay, Fred, let's uh, see if we can answer some questions. No, we can't. That's the end of the show. Um but uh, yeah, we've got uh, we've got a few questions. One's a, a text question, and uh, we'll, be, we'll get to that shortly. But uh, I I don't have a name attached to this question, but uh, I'll fire it away. It's about emissions spectra. This is a question without notice, Fred. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Hello. What is the relationship between an emission spectra and black body radiation? If I heat up a lump of iron, that's like a black body, but why doesn't it just have an emission spectra? And if the sun is made of gas and plasma, why does it have a continuous spectra and not just an emission spectra? Thank you very much. Mm, that's a curly one. Uh, so um, emission spectra versus black body radiation. Um, why is it so? Why is famous it's scientist? Well, it's a great question. And, and- I absolutely understand where that's coming from. And oh, good, because I, I yeah, must confess it was a bit of a head scratcher for well, me. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's start with uh, black body radiation. Um, and by the way, spectra is the plural. It's spectrum for a singular. So right. the spectrum of a black body. Uh, and, and what we mean by that is exactly as the as the questioner says, if you get a lump of iron and eat it up, uh, at certain temperatures it glows red. Uh, and if you... Look at that through a spectroscope, the device that shows you the band of colours ranging from violet up to red, uh, short to long wavelengths. Uh, that band of colours actually uh, for a, a lump of iron that's red hot, it's, it's a smooth curve. It's what the black body uh, actually uh, emits and it, is, uh, it, has it, pe- it has its peak in the red region of the spectrum. As you heat it up more, it gets white hot. Uh, and and that peak shifts basically towards the middle of the spectrum and tends towards the blue when when you you know if you got the iron of course it would melt and vaporize actually by the time you get to those temperatures but and wouldn't be a black body anymore but that's the basis of black body radiation so it is anything that is radiating purely 
by the uh, energy that it contains, a, a solid object. Uh, mm. and, and you and I emit black body radiation, which peaks at a wavelength of about 10 microns, which is well into the infrared region of the spectrum. And that's quite handy. Uh, that's not why we see each other, of course, unless you're looking through an infrared detector, in which case you would see our black body radiation. Yeah. Uh, we've got, just as an aside, we've got one of those in the dome at the Anglo-Australian Telescope, uh, several cameras pointing inside the dome so that you could see if somebody wandered into the dome in the middle of the night in darkness, uh, because that is a dangerous place to be and you would yeah. want to know if somebody was wandering through. So uh, when anybody goes into the dome at night, they they, they, they look like a kind of sepulcher, a sepulchric white figure uh, mm. wandering around. Uh, so that's black body radiation. Whereas emission spectra come from the excitation of in, of individual atoms, basically. Uh, so as an atom uh, gets excited, and there are many ways it can get excited, uh, either being by being heated or by by electrical stimulation. You know, if you have a spark or something like that, it yeah, or, or, or Australia winning the first test against England. All all of that all of that would contribute. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty good, wasn't it? it was pretty quite extraordinary, <laughs> amazing test match. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that and, and that means that you get light uh, of a specific wavelength as the atom falls from a high energy state to a low energy state. Uh, so it falls from uh, Australia winning to England winning uh, <laughs> the test match. Uh, but in doing that, it actually emits uh, a photon of light, uh, which has a specific wavelength. And that's why um, when you look at the spectrum of uh, certain objects, the classic, uh, which we could find easily, used to be sodium vapor street lights, low pressure sodium lights. Point oh, yeah. Go put one of those, you see these, this single orange line. It's actually two to together, um, which is. Uh, what you get when sodium atoms relax after being excited by electricity. Um, so there's nothing else in the spectrum. That's why the, the street lighting, the old sodium vapor lights, were a bit weird in appearance because everything was being illuminated by one color. And it mm. made it very hard to have color dis distinction. And that's one reason why we don't have them anymore because it's thought to be uh, detrimental to safety if you can't see the color of things. So... Um, that's how emission line work. How emission lines work. Now the sun uh, behaves like a black body. Uh, the, the the photosphere, that's the hot surface of the sun, is simply radiating uh, energy uh, because it because it's it's hot. It um, uh, it's it is yes, it's a bunch of atoms, but it's also a solid body and radiating uh, as a solid body. But it's surrounded by an atmosphere, uh, which we call the uh, the chromosphere. And that atmosphere has atoms in it which uh, actually extract the light of uh, the sun at the particular wavelengths that they would emit light if they were being excited. And so we get dark lines in the sun spectrum which correspond to where the bright lines would be if you're looking at a single spectrum. So, for example, there's a, a pair of dark lines at the sodium wavelength and they're called absorption lines. And that's where you've got a black body radiating a light at all wavelengths effectively and, it, and individual wavelengths are subtracted from that by the atoms in a cooler gas surrounding it. That's the. These are um, Kirchhoff's laws of uh, spectral uh, observation, um, and I've just recited them in a very gobbledygook way. But I hope that helps our our listener. Indeed, you have looked thoroughly baffled throughout that whole conversation. There. And now it, it is it, it, well. It, to me, it's complicated, but I'm sure to most people, oh yeah, that just makes sense. Yes. It's it's um it's the stock in trade of how astronomy's work how astronomy works, uh, ever since William Huggins uh, and a colleague of his whose name I can't remember, uh, actually put a spectroscope onto stars back in the eighteen sixties, uh, and heralded the birth of astrophysics for physics mm. stars. Mm. Okay, fascinating. Thanks for the question. Sorry, we don't know who you are, but uh, we appreciate you sending it in. Uh, we have a repeat offender coming our way now in the form of Roger. Hey there, Space Nuts. My name is Roger. I'm a truck driver. I've called in a couple of times before, and tonight I'm traveling across Connecticut. I had a question about exploring 
the outer edges of our solar system. Now, we've sent out probes like the Voyagers that send back information, but they go out and keep on going. And I was thinking about something that could go out and come back. And I was wondering if it'd be a, if we'd be able to catch a comet that's coming by and kind of pig, piggyback a probe on it, either landed on it or more likely put something in orbit around it where the comet could take it out and then bring it back. And I understand this might be, you know, hundreds of years of a voyage, but when it come back, we could retrieve it and get samples and information about the trip and what the, what happens with the comet on the way. And uh, I don't know if something like that's possible or if you've heard of such a thing, but that's my question. And, uh, Still listening to the show and loving it, and, and you guys keep on trucking. <laughs> I knew he was going to do that. <laughs> well, great stuff, Roger. Oh, thank you, Roger. Lovely to hear from you again. And uh, yeah, we've sort of done this a bit with intercepting asteroids and getting samples and bringing them back. Was it Ryugu? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but to actually piggyback a comet for its entire journey, uh, that would be fascinating. Um, it's already been done, actually. When Has think, it? Well, uh, Churyumov Gerasimenko, other known, otherwise known as 67P, ah, which, which was visited on its inward journey to the sun by the Rosetta spacecraft. Uh, That's right. Around it. And Rosetta, um, I mean, it's not quite the same as Roger's suggesting because Rosetta crashed onto the comet. It did. It's now being carried, and that was intentional uh, to effectively end the mission that's so that's now been carried out to the depths of the solar system that the period of 67p is quite short i think i think it's i can't remember how many years it is it's is i think it's 10 years or less something like that from um, my memory seems to think of six years being uh it's, it's period around the sun so it's not one of these uh comets that uh, what would have been originally a comet that fell in from the oak cloud from the depths of the solar system and then got modified by perhaps passing close to Jupiter. Um, so uh, it, it's possible. Uh, but um, the reason why it's not done is because you can do it a lot faster uh, by sending out a probe uh, whose speed you can control and you're not just relying on uh, hitchhiking a ride on a comet uh you you know the so for example new horizons mm. uh, got out to the orbit of pluto in about nine years yeah uh, so uh that that's much slower than your average comet would do it in um and so yes you know even like comet halley takes 76 years to go around once uh so if you hit uh, 6.45 years Six point four five years for sixty seven p. Hey, not bad, eh? It's a, yeah. Since we've talked about sixty seven p, it's still all in there somewhere. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, that's right. So it's um, uh, yeah, yeah. For so you know, if you comet Halley, if you wanted to see what it was like, at it's up helium, the point furthest away from the sun, which I think is it's certainly beyond Jupiter, or maybe beyond Saturn. Uh, that's going to take you 30, 30, 38 years to get there. Uh, half the orbit uh, period, um, whereas uh, yeah, New, New Horizons sped past Pluto nine years after it was launched because we can give it that much higher impetus with rocket motors. So it's a great, it's a lovely thought, uh, and in a sense, as I said, Roger, you, you're right on the money because it's already happening uh, with Rosetta being carried out further out into the solar system. But there are better ways of doing it. Yeah, wasn't Rosetta a successful failure? Uh, it was actually uh, the the one bit that failed was uh, now what was it called the yeah. little um, a lander um, which has a, the name of an island which I've actually visited because they had to move it in the Nile. <laughs> it's all about the, uh, the 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 Nile. I can't remember the name at the moment. That's terrible. That has forsaken me. Uh, but that little lander actually uh, landed successfully. Philae, Philae. That's right. Uh, but fell over. Uh, yes, that's right. I knew something happened. Yeah, and it was in the shadow of a feature on the comet's surface, so it never got the sunlight that it would need to recharge its batteries. Yeah. But that was the one thing that didn't work. But the comet, the 
uh, probe itself was fantastically successful. Yes. And, and, you know, I still see the images popping up on my screen from time to time that it took of the comet nucleus as it orbited around it. Fantastic stuff. There you go, Roger. Already been done. Where were you? Um, <laughs> he was in his truck. He was busy. He was very busy. Dip in size of load. That's good. But, yeah. great. I, but I don't doubt they'll do something like that again. Um, you know, they'll find a, a great target and send something up and... Well, yeah, that's right. And your point was well made that, you know, um, people intercept asteroids uh, at, when they pass reasonably close to the Earth. And, and there's been, yes, Ryugu uh, was Hayabusa 2, Hayabusa 2's target. Mm. Um, uh, Hayabusa 1 visited a uh, comet whose name, sorry, an asteroid whose name I can't quite remember. That's terrible. It'll come back to me. Uh, and uh, we've had um, also there's a there's a NASA probe that's bringing comet, uh, asteroid samples back as well. So so we do have ways of of sampling these objects, uh, but we tend to wait till they go fast quite closely before we try and grab that. Yes, indeed. All right. Um, thank you, Roger. We'll uh, squeeze in one final question. Hi, I'm a long-time listener and thoroughly enjoy your wit and knowledge uh, that permeates every show. Uh, I especially like the questions being answered, and as it happens, I have a question of my own. But we've run out of time. Yeah. Uh, no, maybe it's a dumb question, but I, I can't find the answer anywhere, and I'm sure it's only that I've missed something obvious. To my knowledge, everything started with the Big Bang, where the universe was created from a singularity propelling all bits of the universe. And the age of the universe is supposed to be 13 billion years or so, 13.8, I think it is. But if uh, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, how can the universe be 97 or so billion light years wide? Uh, that is almost four times the speed of light for 13.8 billion years, assuming the Big Bang was in the centre. Um, from Johnny uh, Hyard, I think his name is... Um, Sorry if I didn't pronounce that properly. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, this is an old chestnut, I think, Fred. We we get variations of this from time to time. But and it's a great question as well. Um, and I, I guess it comes about because we are a bit sloppy with our terminology here. Um, so the universe, we believe, is 13.8 million years old. Uh, when we see the flash of the Big Bang, which we still can see because we can look back in time, we're looking back in time exactly as you've said, 13.8 billion years to when the universe was still glowing brightly. And so we see that as the cosmic microwave background radiation across the whole sky, the cosmic wallpaper, as I tend to call it, because it's behind everything else. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, glad you do. Anyway, uh, so that's got a. So it, it's more accurate to say that that horizon beyond which we can't see, you know, you can kind of regard as the edge of the visible universe because we can't see any more of it. Um, we Correctly, we would say that is something we see at a look back time of 13.8 billion years because that's how long it's taken the light to get to us. Now, in that intervening time, the universe has expanded uh, rather a lot, actually, by a factor of about 1,300, if I remember, it's more than 1,000. So the universe has expanded. And what that means is that horizon is now much, much further away from us in physical terms. And in fact, that 97, I think he's about right, it's, it's something like 40 billion light years away. Um, in what we call um, proper coordinates, and by proper coordinates, I mean that essentially the physical size of the universe. Uh, so yes, it's it, the distance of the horizon is is uh, uh, it is um, something like forty five or thereabouts billion light years away, and that makes the observable universe uh, as uh, exactly as Johnny says ninety seven or thereabouts um, billion light years wide. Uh, but uh, we ignore that because we can't see that we 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 can never see the universe as a whole. No. All we can see is our looking back in time as we look out. And that's because the speed of light is the 
basically the most important quantity in the in the universe in terms of our perception of it, uh, and we're quite uh, completely limited as to what we can see by the speed of light. So we, if we say yes, the cosmic microwave background radiation is thirteen point eight billion years light years away, that's kind of correct, but it's not correct either. Uh, it's what we. Uh, it, it's far better to say. It is at a look back time of 13.8 billion years because in reality it's 45 or however many billion light years away it is because of the expansion of the universe. Okay. <laughs> we, I think we, you're right when you say that we, we kind of cocked this up with the terminology yeah, we choose. I, I think, and it's not, I'm not talking about you and me, I'm talking about no. the, whole, the whole astronomical community. No, I just, that's what I meant. It's like black matter, uh, dark matter, and yeah, which is another dark energy, which is another mishmash of words that yeah. gives you a false indication. So, this is the same kind of thing. So, um, short answer, Johnny, is that it's, it's more a case of the terminology being inaccurate than the yeah. numbers being wrong. Yeah, he's, he's saying if, since nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, how can the how can it be? Yeah. And it's just that uh, the universe was much smaller when that light from the cosmic microwave background radiation left on its journey to us. And so, and it's been expanding ever since it's expanded throughout. And it's actually that expansion that has shifted the stretch, the wavelength from visible light as it would have been at the beginning out to microwaves. uh, Mm -hmm. Okay. There you go, Johnny. I hope that doesn't give you a headache, but uh, (laughs) thanks for the question. It was a good one. Uh, if you would like to send us in some questions, please do. And you can do that via our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io and just click on the AMA link or the send us your um, question tab on the right hand side. Uh, if you've got a device with a microphone, it's as simple as just saying who you are, where you're from and asking your question and we'll do the rest. Uh, I'd like to send a shout out to Steve and Tim, who are the hosts of Astronomy Daily. And uh, don't forget to listen into that podcast with Steve and Hallie and Tim uh, every uh, week with updated information about astronomy and space science. Um, they're good supporters of us, so I thought I'd better give them a shout out. And yeah, it's it's me brother. I've got to help my brother. Um, indeed. Uh, thank you, Fred. As always, uh, great fun, and uh, enjoy the new toys. Wish. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We are doing. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you, Andrew, and see you next time. Okay. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and uh, thanks to Hugh in the studio for turning up today. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, it's been a great pleasure. We'll look forward to your company on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. And also thanks to our live studio audience. Thanks for watching. I'm going to press the stop button now. Bye.